just our, our interlude. And now it's my uh, really enormous uh, pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Anne Birmingham. She uh, received her doctorate from Harvard in 1982 and ever since has been teaching in the University of California system. She's currently professor of art history and director of, of the Humanities Center at UC Santa Barbara. Dr. Birmingham is a specialist in British art of the 18th and 19th centuries and has a particular interest in the way that art intersects with politics and social life. She's the author of numerous books, including The Photographic Vision, Landscape and Ideology, The English Rustic Tradition, 1740 to 1860, most recently, Sensation and Sensibility, Viewing Gainsborough's Cottage Door, and most relevant for today, the award-winning uh, 2000 volume, Learning to Draw, Studies in the Cultural History of a Polite and Useful Art. Uh, uh, it's a book that uh, traces the social and cultural processes that enable drawing to emerge as an amateur pastime, um, as well as the different meanings that photography had for people who were not artists. Please join me in welcoming Anne Birmingham, whose uh, talk today is entitled Women's Work, Albums, and Their Makers. Thank you, Malcolm, for that introduction, and thank you all for coming uh, on a beautiful day like this to hear about uh, Victorian photo collage. Now, um, in the interests of truth in advertising, I'm going to say right at the start that in discussing women's work, I'm not going to talk about the individual creators of the albums on view. This is a subject already covered in the excellent catalog accompanying Elizabeth Siegel's brilliant exhibition, Playing with Pictures, The Art of Victorian Photo Collage. By women's work, I mean instead the category of aesthetic objects that were produced as domestic amusements rather than as grand artistic statements. My point today will be that women's work raises interesting questions about media, drawing, watercolor, printmaking, and photography, and their semantic possibilities and limitations. I'll approach the Victorian photo collage today by thinking about its status not as an art, but as the visual medium. I start with an insight by the great theorist of media, Marshall McLuhan, who noted that the first content of any new medium must be a prior medium. Clearly, the photo collage we see in the exhibition are extraordinary examples of how the prior media of watercolor, drawing, printmaking, and photography are all absorbed and transformed into the new medium of the photo collage. But can we say, as McLuhan does, that watercolor, drawing, printmaking, and photography are the content of the photo collage? And if so, in what way do they become its content? And as its content, what might they tell us about the photo collage? These are the questions I'd like to pursue today. I'll begin by examining a form of collage that predates the photo collage, that is the scrapbook. Like the photo collage, it too uses the cut and paste technique to take images out of context and insert them into new contexts. As much as it's like the photo collage, the scrapbook is also distinct from it. And even, I think, in some ways, it's antithesis. For this reason, it's a useful medium to explore by way of contrast, for it throws the peculiar and particular media characteristics of the photo collage into high relief. Finally, I'd like to reflect on how both the scrapbook and the photo collage anticipate modern media of our own time and speculate as to the significance of this. My paper then has three parts, the scrapbook, the photo collage, and women's work and its place in the history of modern media. Let's start with the scrapbook. Scrapbooks date from the 18th century, 
but they became popular in the 19th century when reproductive printmaking became inexpensive, and especially after 1860 when color lithography came to be widely used. As in the case of the Victorian photo collage album, with the scrapbook, we're dealing with a minor art. In this case, with the popular ladies and even children's amusement of pasting down scraps of images, poems, letters, etc., into a book. Let me approach this subject by focusing on a particular example, an album manufactured and sold in the late 1860s and bearing the mark of J.C. Kriker, 129 Fulton Street, on its title page. And you can, I think, just maybe see that right here. The purchaser and composer of the scrapbook is unknown. Its 52 pages appear to have been filled with scraps over the decade of the 1870s. It contains commercially produced chromolithographs, hand-colored soft ground etchings, decorative stamp paper ornaments, as well as the occasional poem, watercolor, and freehand drawing. Scrapbooks were especially popular with women and girls in the second half of the 19th century when commercially produced images and decorative stamped colored and foil papers were a novelty. The album contains a number of childish quotations in English, along with a few in German, which suggests that its maker either spoke German or used the album to copy parts of her German lessons into it. I speak of the maker as if one person made the album. But in fact, we know almost nothing about how this album came to be made, and it may be the work of one or several people. On the scrapbook's first page, we see chromolithographs of a sailing ship and a cupid. On the second page, a hand-colored lithographic print of the ballerina Maria Taglioni in her signature role as the flower fairy in Les Sophides. This portrait is framed in foil paper and ornamented at the bottom with cross stems of poinsettia pressed in gold foil. The portrait's surrounded by chromolithographs of a parrot and a flamingo, an image of a second ballerina on the left and of a woman taking a switch to a child at the right. And finally, with two butterflies, a snail, and a spaniel at the bottom of the page. It's worth taking a moment to survey the scrapbook as a whole. On page 13, we find, an 18th, we find 18th century engravings of the seasons, and on page 14, a poem. On Maggie's eyes of blue, there came a moisture as of dew, while in the garden standing with her robin at her feet, while he begged for some sweet answer from her parting lips so sweet. The poem is surrounded by chromolithographs of forget-me-nots, oak leaves, and shamrocks, a hand-colored fashion plate figure, and silver stamp paper decorations. On page 15, we find flowers cut from wallpaper, and on page 16, a handmade silhouette of a woman. Page 17 is decorated with chromolithographs of a figure in Chinese costume next to an image of Shylock. Below them is a figure in Turkish costume, and at the very bottom, figures of merchant women cut from chat books and hand-colored in watercolor. Page 18 represents a hand-colored soft ground etching of a medieval ruin. A small circular landscape drawn in the pencil style of William Gilpin can be found on page 23 at the top there, along with a hand-colored stipple engraving of a nurse feeding a baby and a chromolithograph of a robin. On page 24, we find a chromolithograph of a man in snowshoes, a stipple engraving of a baby with a muff, a commercially colored stipple engraving of morning glories on which a sprig of lily of the valley has been painted in by hand, and a commercial colored stipple of a ballroom scene. Page 27 contains a chromolithograph of Robinson Crusoe and Friday inscribed, at last he longs for his native land, a commercial fashion plate, and at the bottom of the page, a commercial colored stipple engraving of a harbor scene. At the top of page 28, there's a chromolithograph of a Christmas wreath with the inscription, Hardy Greetings, and below it, a hand-drawn landscape in pencil, and below that, a chromolithograph of a child's head emerging from a bouquet of Lily of the Valley. Page 31 is composed of a carnation cut from wallpaper and opposite on page 32 is a commercially colored stipple engraving of a weasel, a hand-drawn watercolor drawing of a sailboat mounted on decoratively stamped card paper, and a chromolithograph of a drum. 
Now, these pages are not exceptional in any way. On the contrary, they're typical of what is found on every page throughout the album in their mix of commercially produced images and handmade images, sentimental doggerel fashion plate figures, and visual drolleries. Like so much else from popular culture, it's a collection of the already seen, the already spoken, and the already thought. Yet it rises above the level of cliché in its arrangement of this material in what can only be described as something approaching the poet Lautre Amont's famous image, so dear to André Breton and the surrealists of the fortuitous encounter of an umbrella, a sewing machine on a dissecting table. The scrapbook extracts images from their original context and brings them together in a new context. The images become cut loose from their history and original meanings and are assembled in what appears to be random and meaningless ways on a page. Thumbing through the pages of the album, we see an assemblage of items that may or may not be sorted into categories and arranged in hierarchies, but whose parts, when taken together, could never really add up to a single narrative line. Since the diversity of the image types and the discontinuity of their arrangement works against a single interpretive narrative for the page or for the scrapbook as a whole, we need to change our approach from asking, what does the scrapbook mean, to asking, what is it we can learn from it about the kind of interpretive problems and possibilities it presents? The scrapbook, in other words, is a good tool for thinking. Paradoxically, once we give up the idea of narrative, new realms of meaning open up. The discontinuous elements on the book's pages share a surface, not a narrative. This does not mean that the scrapbook escapes history, that it simply becomes a timeless collection of images, for we know such works would have been impossible before printmaking and the widespread practice in the 18th and 19th century of mass producing images of all kinds. In fact, we could say that the scrapbook is an effect of the age of mechanical reproduction and a harbinger of a modern image-based society. It provides an early lesson in how the multiplication of images has the power to transform narrative into collection. The scrap album is a category with, is in a category with the photograph, not the photo collage, and other such mechanically produced popular visual archives which can randomly inventory experience through the multiplication of images. As Marshall McLuhan has noted, the first content of any new medium must be a prior medium. The scrapbook thus absorbs the prior media of the print, the watercolor, water, wallpaper, greeting cards, and transforms them into scraps and then represents them as the content of a new medium, the scrapbook. It's this new form of representation that matters. In the scrapbook, the form, or to fall back on another McLuhanism, the medium is the message. That is to say, the form of the scrapbook, the way it repackages and represents visual information is itself the message. As a new medium, the scrapbook uses prior media the individual scraps to call attention to their new situation as elements in a new work, the scrapbook. While looking backwards to earlier media, the scrapbook looks forward to an emerging media culture, to the photograph, and ultimately, I believe, even to something like the internet. Perhaps another way to think about the scrapbook is to say that it prefigures the kind of high bandwidth of heterogeneous visual information that we can randomly access on the internet or in other nonlinear digital systems of information. Before leaving the scrapbook, I'd like to take up a moment its implications for the question of authorship, the problem of the maker of this book. Despite the heterogeneity of the scraps, the temptation is still, I think, to search out a logical meaning for each page or for the album as a whole that suggests the individual consciousness of its maker. Yet what do carnations, weasels, sailboats, and drums have in common? Is this a rebus or some kind of puzzle? If, like the surrealists, we seek an answer to the questions of authorial meaning in the, in the subconscious, we're immediately faced with the question, who's subconscious? Because after all, not only do we not know who created this album, but we can't even be sure if it's the work of one or several people. 
We would probably be on safe ground attributing this work to a woman or to women, but there is nothing about the album that provides clear evidence as to who these women or this woman was or women were, how old they may have been, what social class she or they may have come from. Moreover, what do these juxtapositions and accumulations of commercially produced images, handmade images, say about individual memory? What memories do we find here? And presumably scrapbooks are intended, in a sense, to commemorate memory. Are these images cut from wallpaper, magazines, prints, and greeting cards aids to memory? And if so, what kind of memory? Is there anything like personal recollection here? Or by contrast, couldn't we argue we're in the presence of a commercially fabricated memory, a kind of false memory imposed by consumer culture on individual consciousness? How much individuality finally can we locate in the album? Indeed, is it even appropriate to talk about individual subjectivity when we're in the presence of social cliches of subjectivity, the syrupy poem, the ideal fashion plate, the commercially created sentiments of hearty greetings. Indeed, we seem to be confronted with a curious melange of the social and the private, the commercial and the handmade, the anonymous and the personal. What the album brings into doubt is the role of private experience in the production of memory. It hints that real experience is not essential to memory, that we can have something like approximate memories, Memories prefabricated for us by a visual culture that we can borrow and adjust as necessary. It suggests that our memories are not individual, original, or even necessarily our own. That they can be mobilized by images that we select from an array of image possibilities, rather than from images imprinted by unique experiences. The scrapbook's collage effect the selection and assemblage of images into an overall decorative pattern may signal individual consciousness, but if so, the composition of each page announces that individuality is a matter of fashioning, not of essence. Moreover, given the somewhat predictable patterns that we find on each page, patterns determined by the rules of symmetry, balance, and repetition, the individual tastes displayed in the album conforms to and is ordered by commonplace design principles. If all of this is true, then we have no choice but conclude that rather than being a monument to memory, the scrapbook is a monument to the end of memory, or rather, at the very least, an example of the invasion and spoilation of memory by a new commercial image culture. Such a conclusion, I think, is premature. For the album holds out other possibilities as well. While it challenges notions of individual subjectivity and with it individual memory, it also proposes new subjectivities with its open dependence on the popular visual culture of its day and its expression of individuality through the selection and arrangement of the already seen and already said. The album does not announce the death of the individual so much as her decentering. I'll explain what I mean. Can't we argue that with the scrapbook, we're in the presence of what today we might think of as a postmodern or posthumanist subject? The scrapbook challenges the idea of the romantic artist. That is, the idea of the individual creator who spins a narrative or creates a work of art that is both uniquely hers and transcendently human. The scrapbook points to an artist who speaks her individual memory and expression through popular culture. Given this, couldn't we say that the scrapbook is not the ruin of memory so much as the presentation of a new model for memory, one suited to a dissentered self? Couldn't we argue that instead of an irrational, surrealist montage, the album presents us with a mnemonic form which assumes that individuals are produced within a social space mediated by images. The very fact that so many pages in the album ask us to look at the decorative arrangement of the whole and at the relations between the scraps rather than focus on a single image initiates a shift in our perception away from the notion of an intrinsic meaning, meaning to the perception of meaning as flexible, unfixed, 
and contingent insofar as it must be sought in the relations among the images rather than in a single image. Given that the scraps originate within popular culture, the production of meaning is not closed or self-referential system, but an open one subject to multiple interpretations. Seen from this point of view, individual memory is not obliterated by the scrapbook so much as it is radically reformulated. What the scrapbook suggests, I think, is that the space of memory is social as much as it's individual. Memory, the scrapbook says, is permeated by culture and social relations in the form of images. Visual signs that are commercially produced in popular culture can reside in memory. The effect of this on subjectivity is to stimulate desire, not as in advertising the desire to consume, but in fantasy, the desire to be. Finally, of course, it's that desire rather than experience that the scrapbook commemorates, the desire for fashion, for grace, natural beauty, romantic love, perhaps even for a foreign place, Germany. The album records how these things are reflected back to the album's maker through visual culture, and how the album's maker imagined herself in relation to them. The photo collage. As much as the photo collage shares with the scrapbook the same cut and paste decontextualization of the image, it does it to quite different ends. I want to discuss how the photo collage reflects on its own formal properties and how in doing so it differs from the scrapbook. Finally, I want to suggest how the differences between the photo collage and the scrapbook anticipate very different types of modern media. All the photo collages on view in the exhibition share things in common that distinguish them from the scrapbook pages that we've just seen. To begin with, all of the photo collages are portraits. So in that sense, they address the genre of portraiture and its expressive possibilities. They're also photographs, so in that sense, they also address the nature of that medium. These photographic portraits are cut out and inserted into hand-painted or drawn abstract and imaginary backgrounds or settings. And this mixing of a realistic and mechanically produced image with what, by comparison, is an imaginative and handmade image is by no means seamless, and the disjunction then between the two media that creates, it's, it's this disjunction that creates a sense of comedy and even surreal unreality in the photo collage. What is surprising is that the realism and truthfulness of the photograph, which one would imagine be able to dominate the photo collage by its sheer representational force, becomes instead subservient to the power of the painted or drawn background. It's the background that gives the photograph its context and meaning, not vice versa. In this sense, the older media of drawing and painting are privileged in the photo collage, for rather than being subsumed by the new medium of photography, they subsume it to older methods of picturing. And you see that here with a, um, a photo collage that inserts um, uh, portraits, photographic portraits into a romantic painted backdrop of a landscape. Despite the presence of the photograph, the Victorian photo collage still values a notion of art as the expression of imagination rather than as a mechanical copy of nature. Another thing the photo collages share is their indifference to what the portrait photograph does best, which is to document the appearance of someone. One would think in a century where many children died in infancy and life expectancies were low, that a photograph of a loved one would be cherished rather than cut up and in some cases made to seem ridiculous. Given that the whole commemorative role of the photographic portrait appears to be of secondary importance in the photo collage, one wants to ask, where does the photo collage stand in relation to memory? Is it, like the scrapbook, about memory's dependence on images, especially the commercially produced, socially shared mass images? While all the photo collages privilege painting and drawing over the new medium of photography, there are several dips, different types of photo collage on view in the exhibition, and I've identified five basic types. The first type describes the appropriated photographic portraits as simply portraits. This type of photo collage simply acknowledges it's a new type of portraiture. 
Most interesting, of course, are those images that playfully reflect on the earlier medium of portraiture, painting and sculpture in this case, that are now being challenged by the photograph. This first type of photo collage refers to photography's descriptive and iconic powers. As McEwen would note, the content of these photo collages is the prior medium of straight photography. This type of collage underscores the nature of the photograph as primarily a medium of descriptive portraiture. The second type no longer underscores the portrait-making power of the photograph, but instead turns it into decoration by subsuming the photographic portrait into an all-over painted decorative design. The third type of photo collage transforms photographic portraits into other things, such as postage stamps, playing cards, jewelry, even soap bubbles. These photo collages suggest the mutable power of drawing and painting to transform the photographic portrait into anything and everything. They prepare the way for the next two types, which elaborate this power. The fourth type of photo collage involves placing portraits of people in painted situations. These can be backgrounds such as landscapes or domestic interiors, or activities such as sailing or ballooning, or completely fantastic dreamscapes. These backgrounds might allude to something about the people in the photographs, their pastimes and pleasures, but more likely they simply express the collage maker's desire to imagine them in particular situations. Often these are situations in which the subjects of the photograph would never in reality find themselves. The sheer inventiveness of the painted and drawn backgrounds are important to the fourth type. The settings can be playful, humorous, satiric, outrageous, fantastic, all the things that the photograph can't be by virtue of the fact that it's a mechanical copy of reality. In demonstrating the limits of the photograph, these painted and drawn backgrounds highlight the character and individuality of the maker, of the artist. The individual who paints or draws the backgrounds becomes as much the subject of the collage as the people in the photographs. In a sly, self-referential move, the photo collage draws attention to the album maker, her wit, her cleverness, her opinions, and her tastes, without nominally seeming to do so. It both asserts and elides her character and her artistry. The fifth type of photo collage makes statements about the photographed individuals, their characters, their relationships, their pleasures and pastimes, and their relationship to the album maker in ways that may or may not involve elaborate backdrops and settings. In addition to commemorating, uh, in, in addition to commenting on individuals, these photo collages can also comment on categories of persons, the language of flowers, uh, combined with photo portraits, for instance, here on a page from a film or album. Some of these comments are cliches. All children are like little fairies in a fairy world. Women are jewels, but most are not and seem particular to the person. Uh, and this is, again, that page from uh, the Princess Alexandra album. The creative impetus motivating so many of the photo collages of the fifth type is to create a background that says something amusing or revealing about the individual person photographed. As a result, this type of photo collage is not about memorializing the way the person looked so much as telling us what the person was like, her interests, her personality, her affections, her value to the album maker. These photo collages return the mechanically mass-produced subject of the photograph to her real self, the self that the photograph can't represent, the self that lives beyond the world of mere appearances. Types four and five resist the mechanical and the superficial and substitute for them depth and essence. It's a move away from description of appearances and a move towards meaning. And as I hope to show, it's also a move towards narrative. To return to McLuhan's insight, that the content of each new medium is an older medium, we can say that in the second, third, and fourth type of the photo collage, watercolor and drawing are the content of the photo collage. And as content, they reveal the differences between themselves and the new medium of photography. With their drawn and painted backgrounds, these photo collages pull away from description, 
rather than embrace the photo, photograph's image-making powers, they undercut it um, and uh, reveal its limitations as a medium. In these photo collages, painting and drawing's ability to design patterns and imaginary worlds emerge as superior to the photograph's documentary nature. So while the first type of photo collage is about the photograph and its descriptive powers, all the other types are about the limitations of the photograph's literal descriptive powers when juxtaposed with the collage maker's artistry and imagination. So with the photo collage, we find a medium in tension with itself. All the photo collages, but especially the fourth and fifth type, depend for their impact and legibility on a social network of interpreters who know the photographed figures in the collage. In contrast to the scrapbook, the society the photo collage alludes to is not the world created by mass media, a world of anonymous strangers drawn together through the consumption of mass-produced images, but instead, it's the private world of a small circle of intimates, friends, and acquaintances. It's a world of house parties, dinner parties, games, and of a society stratified by class. These photo collages not only rely on private and traditional social networks, they also comment on them. In their allusions to the individual character of the sitter and to the private networks of influence, affection, and desire that link them, the photo collages initiate the album viewer into a particular social world, an individual point of view, the world and view of the album maker. As Elizabeth Siegel observes in her catalog introduction and uh, also in her talk today, Victorian photo collage was primarily a feminine accomplishment. Accomplishments were amateur modes of art making employed by women. Accomplishments like drawing and music making were activities intended to entertain friends and family and to draw attention to the talent of the amateur. Given this, what kind of accomplishment was the photo collage? Because they play with real people, inserted into unreal contexts, Victorian photo collages almost inevitably take on a kind of comic, even pointed satiric edge. They're not an accomplishment like playing the harp, which if done well would be a delight to all, but instead their amusements had at somebody's expense. Often they're the visual equivalent of the bon mot, the witty pun, or the clever aside. At other times, they partake of the more passive-aggressive art of innuendo, the sly, sideways attack, the indirect thrust. Humor here is the essence, and as we know from Freud, jokes are rarely innocent. Only occasionally is the album maker herself ever skewered in her own pages. This gesture, of, and, and we saw that in the example of the um, golf album, where uh, she represents herself as one of the ducks. Um, the gesture of including the maker in among her subjects and subjecting her to their comic fate is a graceful social note, one that indirectly, again, asserts the album maker's cleverness while directly asserting her good humor. As both the subject and object of her own wit, the album maker's cunning and ingenuity is foregrounded in the photo collage. In this privileging of the author or artist of the collage, the photo collage separates itself sharply from the scrapbook and its tendency to obscure the individuality and identity of the creator. There are other important ways in which the photo collage differs from the kind of collage one finds in the pages of a scrapbook. The heterogeneity of the scraps and their discontinuous and seemingly random arrangement is at odds with the photo collage's commentary on its subjects. In many cases, like this, the photo collage's visual information is arranged so that it tells a story or alludes to the interests, character, and social position of the figures photographed. And here you see them all inserted into an Italianate uh, landscape filled with ruins. Whereas the scrapbook frustrates any possibility of grasping the maker's point of view, the photo collage continually draws attention to the maker in her social world. While the scrapbook incorporates a range of media, commercially printed, colored images, hand-drawn, um, uh, and even wallpaper in a very non-hierarchical way, the photo collage continually draws attention to its media and their formal attributes. In the scrapbook, the visual information supplied tends to be mass-produced, it's only in the choice and arrangement of the scraps that the artistry of the maker can be glimpsed. 
In the photo collage, the painted backdrops create an imaginatory and evocative context for the mechanical portraits, thus highlighting the skill and cleverness of the maker. While the scrapbook continually leads one away from the creator into an anonymous world of commerce, the photo collage continually returns us to the individual maker, her taste, her artistry, her social world, and point of view. In all these ways, the photo collage still partakes of an older ethos of art making. It values individual creativity and imagination over the industrial and the mass produced. While it makes use of the photograph, it subjects it to the formal properties and imaginative traditions of drawing and painting. At a time when photography was still a relatively inflexible medium and a difficult one for most amateurs to manage, the photo collage enabled the amateur to create images and situations that real photographs could not approximate. Unlike the scrapbook, which is about filling a space rather than creating meaning, the photo collage is about telling a story. In addition to alluding to something about itself and its subjects, many photo collages, as Marta Weiss explains in her fine catalog essay, imagine the page as a stage. These photo collages create sets for their portrait subjects, and in doing so, imagine narrative situations for them to act in. Many photo collages create fictions and set their subjects in improbable, comic, and even fantastic situations. The photo collages meshing a meaning, character, setting, and situation into story-like visual environments that reflect on the imagination of the maker, push the photo collage away from description and decoration and toward narrative. Given their reliance on photography, and their attempts to make the photograph into a narrative, we can see these photo collages as one of the many 19th century harbingers of motion pictures. Women's work. And you're looking at, um, on the left, an 18th century print room where prints would be cut out and then stuck on the wall as decoration. Um, you're looking at a decoupage box uh, where prints are cut out and pasted on the box. Um, and then shellacked, and then you're looking at the bottom at fire screens and lampshades, uh, which were commercially produced for ladies to decoupage, uh, or uh, to collage, and also to hand paint. Scrapbooks and Victorian photo collage albums, along with other works of assemblage, such as patchwork quilts or collaged fire screens, provide us with a collection of visual media that prefigure contemporary visual culture. Lacking an authoritative voice, women found other ways to speak through culture. If the period spoke to them as consumers, they in turn found a way to appropriate and use the products of commercial culture for their own purposes in scrapbooks. If the mechanization of the image came to them in the portrait photograph, they transformed it into works of art that spoke of the power of individual meaning and creative imagination. One could argue that far from being trivial, such forms of art making are extraordinarily revealing. They show us in graphic visual terms the position of women at the beginning of the modern period. That is to say, their absence from the production of high culture, but their deep engagement with mass culture. Their works place them in dialogue with modernity in ways we're only now coming to terms with. It's this kind of dialogue that I believe we need to pay attention to if we're to come to a deeper understanding of the past and its relevance to the present. For finally, there is a reciprocal feedback loop between what older media reveal about new media and vice versa. For just as earlier media reveal tendencies in their graphical organization that anticipate later media, so too today's digital design activities enable us to look back at earlier media, like the scrapbook and the photo collage, with new understanding and appreciation. These older forms become more than just whimsical diversions. They can be seen as interesting and even prescient ways of organizing visual information. They make us consider the functionality of image design, how it structures information, how it directs or deflects meaning, how it customizes knowledge. Our own digital modes of organizing information are highly visual, 
And as such, they sensitize us to the role design and images have historically played in cognitive activities associated with the creation of meaning. In conclusion, women's work, like scrapbooks and Victorian photo collage, enable us to see modern media in a new way, as the logical outcomes of earlier, more modest reproductive technologies and their gradual evolution towards more expanded and immersive visual environments. Because of our modern media revolution, women's work takes its rightful place in the history of visual culture. And I'm tremendously pleased, but not surprised, to see that two great museums, like the Chicago Art Institute and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, understand this. Thank you.